Thank you. Um, okay, let's start. Uh, a little bit, one slide about the company, just, just to give you the background and why we think that we are good in what we're doing. So the company has been around for four years. <laughs> the numbers flipped. It's Mac to uh, Windows kind of nice thing. So we have over not 5 million downloads, 500 million downloads. That's half a billion downloads. So it's a bigger number a little bit. So this is nice. 200 people in six countries, uh, Israel, Macedonia, Bulgaria, China, Ukraine, uh, and the US. Uh, we released to date uh, over 300 apps, games, apps, educational apps, uh, different titles. And we accumulated, uh, so we have around 33 million unique ac active monthly users. So it means the users are, w obviously we don't have 500 million users, so an average user has something between four to 10 different games that, that, that we released. So these are the numbers, kind of give you the validation of what we do. Um, from a download perspective, and obviously we want to be on the right side, not on the left side, but right now we'll have to settle for the left side. Left side is the downloads by AppAny. So we were number seven in September with nice names, Gameloft, King, EA, Rovio, all the, all the big names. On the right side, all the big money generators. So we're currently we still occupy the left side, and hopefully from the left side we want to move to the right side. So this is the, the tactics. Amazon, we're doing well. So, so you probably want to ask why. It's an interesting lecture how to make 300 games in four years, but why do you want to make 300 games? So uh, one reason is we didn't know how to make different type of games. So we didn't know how to make originally, when we started, you had Angry Birds and you had all sorts of uh, simulation games from uh, Tinyco. And what we knew is to make simple games, small games. We understood that there is a a kind of what they call deep blue ocean in the kids category. Kids uh, got more and more devices. It was 2010, iPad was announced. Uh, Steve Jobs announced iPad and then immediately said, well, Flash is not going to be there. So he said, wow, it looks like a great opportunity. There is a huge amount of content uh, distributed in different sites that kids consume. And this content uh, is not allowed to go onto any of Apple device. We took a bet that it's not going to be to be the same on, on, on Android, and eventually it happened that Google Play also stopped supporting uh, Android. And we, we, we developed a, a technology platform that would allow us to uh, uh, produce content, small content, simple content. Originally, we started with kids' content very easily and very uh, in, in, a, in a very fast manner. So we, we created this technology. We like to simplify it for non technical people, but we can, there will be more technical slides, but this is the app toaster. So we said, yeah, Flash gives you a very simple way. You put uh, your brain in, your heart, your music, your creativity, and up, you choose a template, whether it's an interactive book or an educational app or one of the casual games for kids, and up, out jumps uh, an app. And this is a nice uh, uh, concept. We, we wanted uh, teams around the world, and you saw the company is, uh, is global to be able to very easily create uh, content uh, that would uh, allow for an increase, in increasing amount of quality during time. The creative process probably uh, you all know very well, but I'll just visit the, the, the points just to see that we're on the same page. So we s you start from the concept, th then perform a creative flow, a concept art, art, the design, the sound, the app development, QA, which is iterative all the time, but then obviously, uh, and in the beginning even, you start talking to the marketing people because sometimes you build uh, great games that people feel that they want to build, but no one wants to download them because they are really cool. You want to build them in the office. They sound really great. But then when you say, OK, how is the icon going to look? And what's going to be the text in the App Store? And why, wh why is it going to be interesting for people to click in the funnel icon? see the screenshot and then download, and then you find out that you develop this game just with no reason because uh, uh, only a small amount of niche users are going to download it. So obviously marketing is very important, monetization, at the end you're not doing it for fun, at least we, we, we're doing it for fun, but also for uh, a living. 
and publishing it into the app store, the different app stores, different uh, 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 if it's uh, Apple, uh, Google Play, Amazon, and, and, and different ones. So when we started out, we had this uh, very simple, we were a small company, we started out, we were five, ten people, so it was very simple, everyone was doing everything, uh, we were doing the dishes and the QA and the concept and the development and it was very easy. And we finally, at the end of 2010, we managed to produce the platform, the toaster, and then we produced our first app, which was Christmas Tale, it was a, a Christmas story. Uh, 2010, we launched it onto the App Store. It was number three in the U.S. overall for uh, around two weeks. Generated half a million downloads back back then in 2010. So we were very happy. And then things went well, and we started growing. So the company started growing, and very in a very fast way. We were in a problem. We were producing small games. We know the audience, kids. They they will not play a game for 300 hours or 20 hours. They consume for. 30 minutes on average, maybe some of the 30 to 45 minutes, and the uh, whales in kids, they will consume it for two hours, and there isn't any whales in kids when it comes to monetization, so so no no use for that. So, so the industry works in a cell model, so it means everyone, the whole team sits together, the producer, the creative team, the developers, the QA, they all work together, they iteratively improve the game, they soft launch, they uh, uh, and, 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 and they produce a game. But in this type of small games, it wasn't effective because if you're going to do, if you're going to put this, the team on a small game, what you're going to get is a lot of idle time. So we had to move out from a cell model into a matrix model, which makes things a lot more complicated. So we went through uh, a lot of evolutions. We started the, uh, 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 making plans, how many teams we want to have, how many apps a month we want to have. Uh, we went to the marketing team and they told us, look, if we want to be uh, the Apple, the, the App Store uh, has a kind of a weekly cycle. You see Apple and you see other companies, they launch on a Wednesday, on Thursday. Apple is putting the best new apps and, and then some apps go on top and then slow, little by little they drop the charts and, uh, and unless you're Angry Birds or, uh, or uh, Flappy or, or you, you got the cra crazy luck, then you're not going to stay there. So marketing said, okay, great. We need to have at least every weekend a new title to launch because people will download, it will go down and then we launch another one, it will go up and the cycle will then uh, continue to, to generate uh, downloads, users and kids, they download one game, they see another one coming and they say, wow, cool, I like, like that one, maybe I'm going to like the other one as well. And while there were studies back then in 2011 that uh, people keep only 37 or 97, there was a magic number of how many apps they keep. I can tell you, and I have two daughters, that uh, kids keep thousand apps. As, as long as there is memory on the device, they're going just to download and download and download. So after a process, uh, we started defining the roles and responsibilities. So obviously, they are industry standard, but some of them needed to be allocated for the duration of the game. Some of them only were, were doing part of it. So executive producing, the, the two founders in the company, me included, we ex uh, 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 produce all of the all of the titles so basically they need to get a kind of a management uh, endorsement we believe that this is a, a good way to uh, to know what the company is producing then we have a creative uh, uh, product the obviously game designer uh, a producer and the producer is a key role because the producer is the actually the person who needs to handle all of the difficulties and complexities of managing this tiny schedule, uh, art allocation and creative allocation and just two, one week of sound or two weeks of sound and handshake with the marketing to start planning the icons or start planning who, who, who is going to be the, the characters. I can tell you that in many cases, for instance, when you get to the icon design, then you find out that the icon is not working. You launch the icon, you do all sorts of A-B testing, doesn't convert very well. Then the marketing people, they say, okay, we need to add the character. So you add the character in the icon, then you say, okay, so I have a character in the icon, but then I don't have it in the game. So now I need to put the character in the game because it's more interesting for people to download, uh, to press on an icon with the character, so they expect to see it in the screenshot and then they expect to see it in the game. So 
a lot of the a lot of the processes are 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 complex small handshakes a lot of uh, a, a lot of back and forth between the people who are who are allocated on the game production and the people who are allocated on uh, the game distribution so a producer uh, role is a, is a really key role in making the game uh, fit the timeline fit the budget and fit the, the goals uh, we have the art teams, we have global art teams, so we, had, uh, we have art teams in, in India, in Macedonia, in Bulgaria, in Ukraine, and in India. It's very difficult, some of them are concept artists that are doing the, the art, concept art, and then some are doing the backgrounds, and sometimes you're missing all sorts of wardrobe items or different items. So it's really hard, and sometimes you come to a review and you say, the game looks good, but we're missing 50 items, so now you need to uh, add additional 50 items, so you need to allocate uh, 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 teams that are vacant for that. So obviously, again, very hard work for the producer. Implementation teams and development teams doing all of the development, sound, and then the last mile, QA, integration, and ALM. These are really uh, brave people in the QA because always the time for the game is set. And, and you never make it in the time to, to handshake to, to the QA people in the time that you allocated, but you are never willing to say, okay, let's have another week for the game. So obviously, we explain to the QA people that they have a set amount of time, but they need to work just 24 hours a day in order to uh, make the, the release on time. So uh, this is uh, uh, the paradigm that, that they live under. Global roles, obviously, art director that is overseeing all of the quality of the art, creative director that is trying to manage the creative process, a game level director who is working on the game level design, even in kids' games, but we also produce today other casual games. We have a lot of uh, game level design for, for the arcade games. Uh, studio managers, which manage this complexity, uh, and they have a responsibility on a certain uh, uh, release and brands and uh, uh, research and development platform teams. Uh, the app creation flow uh, from the creative side, studio creative, uh, market research, external sources, and just everyone in the company, we have these innovation day types and we get a lot of ideas from people just writing on Facebook to us or, uh, or proposing different types of games. Then it goes to the brand managers. We have four brands, three brands for kids and one brand called Crazy Labs that we launched uh, in the last year that is targeting uh, uh, older kids or kids at their heart. Uh, so they decide, the brand manager decide which, which uh, title is going to be accepted and then it goes into the studio. The studio is being chosen from the different studio and the process which I mentioned, marketing, marketing assets, store managers, because you need to talk to the Apple, you, you want to talk to Apple Store, maybe you're going to get featured, it's hard, but you want to try a Google Play uh, Store, you want to, to talk to Amazon. So it's a lot of uh, a complexity and for each title you need to decide for which one you're going to, to do which elements and how much you're going to invest in the rollout process. So at the end, it influenced the company structure. So we started out uh, in January of 2013. There were 30 people in the company, 20 in Israel and 10 in Macedonia. And as I told you, now 200 in six different regions. So we, we had to take decisions on how the company is going to be structured. So on the left side, we have the uh, production, Taptel production, which is the one responsible for producing the different games. We started out obviously with having their studios for kids, so uh, uh, KFC, which is the, the casual games for kids, and the educational studio. Uh, but, but then we added the, uh, the casual games in Unity studio later on, and uh, a simulation studio. So there are, there are different studios that we uh, added along the way, since we had a kind of a pluggable structure to the, to the, to the uh, to Taptel production, it was quite easy for us to add these additional studios. Each, each department has its own R&D department, so it means there is no one global VP of R&D for all, all of Taptel. There is one for production and one for publishing. These are two separate concerns. One for providing the best technology to the studios, for uh, allowing them to reuse components, to uh, integrate easily with all sorts of third parties that are relevant for the games, <laughs> uh, ser uh, uh, server-side gaming. 
And, and the publishing side, which is responsible for everything from user acquisition, monetization, business development, producing the videos, um, and, and Tabtel uh, 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 Publishing has its own R&D department because one of the biggest or hardest things that we, that we discovered is it's, since it's hard to make money, you need to integrate to a lot of third parties, be that uh, analytics, that is a simple one, but, but you want uh, uh, ads, so there are, I know, 30 or 100 different ads, some of them through mediation, not through mediation, rewarded videos, interstitials, uh, the different store in a purchase mechanism. So, so we developed this layer, which we call, which we call the uh, publishing SDK, which just has all this infrastructure inside, all of the different integrations. And then the game studios, they don't have to worry about how they are going to monetize. Uh, they just say, we want to monetize here like that, and here like that, and there like that. And, and then through a technical layer, all they do is just mention the locations and then what they want to use, and that's being provided by the publishing SDK, and this is why there is a separation. So this is a, a very nice piece that we added along the way and took us a lot of time to understand that uh, it's, a, it's a key in being successful, having a lot of ready-made infrastructures so the game people can only focus on what is best for the game. A little bit more on the technology. So again, on the left side is the gaming uh, SDK supporting anything from the traffic management, analytics, the social, the connect, uh, shelves, uh, the user accounts, uh, uh, events, and different things. And on the right side, uh, uh, the, the publishing SDK uh, with a lot of integration with third parties, uh, APIs for push and for uh, uh, and supporting both Cocos to DX and, uh, and Unity. So this is a nice piece of uh, technology that really uh, helps us getting uh, up to speed and being really productive in in uh, the ability to uh, add and to make at least ten games. Uh, each month, we're actually we're doing a, a lot more than that. A little bit on the lesson learned. So one thing, when you're making a lot of games and people are paying for, at least some of them are paying for the games, especially in iOS, less in Android, where you find out that your APKs are just launching some different websites. But you need someone to manage the portfolio. So when someone pays, then if that is going to break, if iOS 8 comes out, and it's not working anymore, and you paid three ni even $3.99, $4.99, then they want it to work. So you need to, you need to have a really good mechanism uh, for uh, uh, supporting and for up uh, keep keeping all of your portfolio updated. This is not an easy task, because a lot of developers, they say this game is not making any more money. The RPD now is low, and there aren't many downloads. So it's not economical for me to download. But then the users who downloaded your brand they're not going to download again and pay if, they, if they're not happy with your support. So maybe five years past, maybe it's OK, maybe three years. But obviously, the App Store changes fast. Uh, iOS State just released, and a lot of the uh, integration points were not ready, a lot of crashes, a lot of problems. And people do expect you to support what they paid money for. So, uh, so one of the lessons that we learned is you need a really good portfolio management team. You need someone. So the hand, uh, there is a handshake, obviously, in the bigger game between the, the cell that makes the game and the ops team that, that is doing the incremental content changes and, 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 uh, and keep the game alive. But when a game is not alive anymore from a content perspective, you still need to keep it technically alive because people paid for it. And if you want to keep your brand, they need to do it. So we have a portfolio management team. The, the picture doesn't lie. It's, if you want to update 300 different games each three months or four months, so uh, through uh, around five stores, so it means uh, iOS with testing all of the iOS devices and new devices and old devices, and iOS 8, for instance, it came out now, and Android with the new Android uh, the devices and, and types, and Amazon and Windows if you if you're doing that as well. So this is a big uh, undertaking, but we see it as an investment in the, in the brand power and in the, in, the, in the name of the company. Consistency is critical. So uh, while uh, 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 we improved significantly during the road, we started out, we had a certain amount of uh, skill in art and in understanding art and in understanding gaming. 
but uh, users want you to consistently produce content. And consistency, consistency is also important in uh, deciding uh, what you want to keep on producing. So we, what, what, what works very nicely when you do small games, when you're doing a big game, then obviously you, can you try and incrementally improve the game. Uh, in small games, you don't go back uh, to games that you launched, but you create a franchise. So in, for instance, in February of 2013, we launched Baby uh, Dress Up and Care, a Dress Up and Care application for kids. It got uh, around uh, uh, 3 million downloads uh, in, the, in the first uh, couple of weeks. Uh, it was nice success, got to uh, number two uh, in the App Store in around num top five in 50 countries. So it was more than the regular success. So we identified the characters, and we didn't know up front. We identified the characters as a certain appeal to the age group, and immediately we launched a series. So we said, from now on, we're going to do once every month another baby series. And one is Baby Heroes, where there are fire, fire, firemen and, and gardeners, and they save the city from hurricane. Another, there are doctors. So, so uh, uh, understanding and, and analyzing what works well and giving the users and, and, and some consistency. And in the kids area or in the small apps area, it can work very well with just putting all of the things that you learn into the next title that you launch, rather than updating uh, uh, the older uh, title. Obviously, in bigger games, then you keep on incrementally improving uh, what you launched. We're doing uh, uh, bigger games today, we keeping these brands, but also doing bigger games. And then, obviously, it's a, it's a different story. Um, identify trends in competition. Uh, App Store is visible. Everyone takes ideas or let's not call it copy from everyone. The amount of uh, angry birds, angry piggies, angry whatever, and different types. So it's not a shame to do things or to, uh, to look at what other people are doing well. And, and it's important to leave the App Store, to do a competitive analysis, feel where, where you are up, uh, what you're up against, and uh, who, are, who is the best competition, and learn from them what they're doing good. And I can tell you that even in the kids' market, when we are, we are one of the biggest brands, but there are very good competition. Uh, obviously, companies like Tokaboka, very high brand uh, educational, but also companies like Libby, and other companies that has a very good uh, brand in the uh, kids' uh, area. Very important part is analytics. Uh, we have hundreds of millions of sessions, around I think between half a billion and a billion a month. So that generates several billions of events. Very hard to examine all of them. So you need to put very good uh, analytics team that they will be able to filter what are the important events to analyze. And then it goes to consistency because the users ex expect that you would uh, what they like, that it will keep showing in, in the other games and what, what they didn't like and uh, wouldn't show. And I can tell you it's not ne necessarily intuitive. Things that uh, the gaming uh, team thought was cool and th or other things they thought, wow, we used that for five times. People are sick of that. And the analytics showed completely different. Uh, it was used five times. It was still 95% uh, completion used by all of the, uh, all of the uh, uh, users. So, so a lot of the things uh, you can just see in the analytics. One thing to check about analytics, in a lot of cases we found out if analytics doesn't make sense because it will be a meeting where the chief of analytics or whatever the title of the analytics person that you have or even you looked in Flurry or whatever yourself and you see something, people clicked a lot of time on the menu and you say, well, it's not good to have a menu because I didn't want them to press on the menu. But a, lo a lot of the logic that you work in analytics you need to understand it from the, from the psychology perspective. We saw many times when it was very, in many cases, the analytics team came and said A, B, C, D, and they said, ah, we understand. So we didn't think about it up front, but it makes sense. When it didn't make sense, then we wanted further investigation, and in at least 90% of the cases, uh, it was just either a problem in the analytics or, or something that was uh, uh, the deduction was wrong. So the, they said many people clicked on the, on the menu. We didn't want them to click, but it was because there was a big button that was, uh, that was moving on the menu. So it wasn't uh, 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 the, the analytics was correct, but the, the, what they assumed or, the, or, or what they deducted was wrong. So keep always and try and understand that the psychology behind the remarks that the analytics team are making. Keeping sight of quality, uh, 
It's very easy when you produce a lot of games to, uh, and you have deadlines and you want to launch because uh, you need to start making money on the game that you invested to uh, let go and to say, okay, it's, we'll work on this device, on this not, or just to say, I must release it. I cannot see another cycle of the game again, uh, especially when you're doing, when we're doing the, 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 the bigger game, just testing a game with 60 levels take you hours and hours and at some point, you, you, you don't want to see the 60 levels again. But obviously, without quality, uh, you're not going to go anywhere. Uh, and it's very easy to uh, try and say, OK, we, we have the production timeline. We have, and especially for us, we're producing a lot of games. Every weekend, we're going to launch a new game. If, you're n if the studio, if one of the studios is not going to meet the deadline for upload, then he's not going to be launched on that weekend. He's not going to get his marketing spot, his promotion, and then another studio is going to get that. So, uh, so for them, for the studios, the, in the internal and the external studios that we work with, it's very important to try and meet the deadlines. But uh, the balance between getting it in the right quality and launching in, in time should be always uh, kept. So, uh, so that's important. Obviously, listening to your users is a cliche, but. Uh, uh, in a lot of times, we think that we are smarter than the users. We know better the game. We understand uh, more. And while it's true, we know better. We're smarter, maybe not. But they are the ones playing with the game. They are the ones who will download it or the next one. Uh, and, uh, and you need to find the ways to facilitate the communication lines through the analytics, but also to, through some direct channels, a lot of uh, play testing, and a lot of ways to find what your users are are thinking a lot of things that we thought that were extremely cool were shot down and burned by users not really liking it and not uh, and not uh, playing with it. Uh, so uh, so uh, things are intuitive sometimes. In many cases, the intuitive things are 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 not really working, and uh, uh, and it's very important to understand and understand why. And without talking to the user, it's really hard to understand why what they are thinking and why that they are thinking. Beware not to take a very small, my kid didn't like it, my seven-year-old or my grandparent he didn't play with it, so it's not going to, to be a success. There is a, some tendency to do home checking and then understand from home checking a lot on the global market. But uh, if you want to do uh, play testing or if you're getting a lot of information from your users, do it in a obviously professional and comprehensive way. Um, so the, just to sum up my key takeaway, so consistent game production, for us it was critical. When you're doing smaller games, uh, you can make m um, uh, money out of it. The company is profitable. Tabtel is, is making money. It's uh, growing. So it's not so bad to make small games. Uh, obviously, we also like, and a lot of the creative team, they say, OK, we like the small games, but when are we going to make the big games? So at some point, we started also with Crazy Labs making the uh, the big games, uh, modular team. Uh, you need the team to be efficient and effective. At the end, if you're not making just the games for fun, you want to make some economics out of it. You don't want people sitting and doing idle time. And you also don't want people to get bored, because then they will find a lot of tasks to do that not necessarily you want them to do. Uh, some of them will create more work for the, for the team. Portfolio management. Uh, if you want to uh, keep your brand, then you need your games to continue working, at least technically, if, if not get more content into them. And quality, uh, plan ahead, plan the analytics, plan for consistency with your users, and just uh, uh, do it continuously. Thank you. Question. Hello, my name is Özgür. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I have a uh, quick question. Uh, how big was your uh, company uh, four years ago? And uh, you, you are now 200 employees. Uh, and what was the speed of development at the beginning? So I am trying to estimate your uh, de development and how quickly you could uh, make uh, new games with how many people? In June 2010, there were three founders. In October 5, 2010, then we launched the first title. 
then we were around and then we launched the early 2011 the site in Macedonia but we had three people there so around until early 2013 there were 30 people growing kind of uh, gradually every quarter a few people and even with 30 people we launched around four to five titles every month uh, but they were smaller titles so the complexity as the app store developed kids even kids they want more complex games not too complex but they are not uh, just doing, and we started with interactive books, which was simpler, and educational uh, apps, which were simpler. Moving to casual games for kids, kind of the age group. So we started two to four, then four to six. We added four to six age years old, then six to 12. And then from uh, January 2013, we kind of uh, jumped uh, from 30 to a year later, we were 140, and now uh, 200. Uh, so very hard to manage the growth, very hard to manage uh, growing a company uh, in parallel to staying effective, uh, to having everyone know what they do. It's a, it's a big, big, uh, an interesting challenge. How do you transfer the audience, your players, from one product to another product? Some kind of cross promo? Yes, yes. this is an excellent question. One so thing we, we have the same problems. We have a lot of games uh, and try to take our players from one game to another. It's not very easy. So one thing we've done, I think, better than most, and it's not only us, but a lot of uh, the kids. So. So when you, when you are taking consistency and when you find out from the analytics what they like, so we have templates of gameplay. We have a gameplay which is called the fiasco type and we have the baby series and doctor series. So for us, for instance, a typical conversion rate, uh, conversion rate which is, you know, we, sh we have a campaign management system. So we launch our own campaigns. Uh, we control uh, which apps, which groups, which a lot of parameters so we can really optimize and if you've seen it twice it didn't click you can see another one and there is a, a, a primary and secondary so there is a very complex system at the end it generates for the primary campaign that we launched anything between two and a half percent uh, two and a half percent meaning impression times the download so two and a half percent to download to five percent which is really a quite a big number usually you see less than one percent in a kind of typical casual games for, uh, for older. Uh, we, we launched also uh, uh, casual games for uh, higher age groups and there it's not the same. There if we get one and a half percent doing all of the system that we have then it's uh, good. We are st still trying to find. I, I think that there is also a way uh, to, to, uh, to get there to higher numbers but yeah this is a big big challenge. F uh, luckily for us in the, in the kind of two to, uh, I know, 13, even more to 16. When they like something, they really like something and they will continue on download, downloading that. So uh, uh, that's... Do you have your own cross promo? Yes, system? we originally we started using uh, Chartboost, which is also a very good system. But uh, one, you know, a lot of companies, they get bought and then suddenly like uh, test try, they stop working with Android. So, but uh, Chartboost are great guys, I, I highly recommend if you don't have the resources to start with them. But at the end, we needed something that is interlinked to our analytics, that uh, knows what is the best title at which day, to which age group to, uh, to launch. So you get, uh, you know, at the end, it's a game of percentages. So 80%, so the f getting the first thing, which and Chartboost gave us really good result, but then getting uh, or almost additional 50% boost, that takes building a lot of technology. And for that, uh, you need to have the resources to do that. And we decided that it is a good investment for us at some point to do it. But uh, when we started, just Chartboost was a great option. Hi. <coughs> it's Lucas Hi. from Tequila Games. Uh, what you guys are doing is clearly um, a bit unusual, although it's very impressive. I mean, 300 games. And as you told us uh, on average 10 games per month so um, as you just mentioned that this is the game of percentages I was wondering whether you can share 
uh, what's the percentage of your games that are hit versus miss? Uh, that's one question. And secondly, uh, I'm very curious to hear on um, how, what's your approach to support the products uh, after they are, they are launched? And how do you determine and how do you shift the resources um, uh, so they can so they can grow? We'll uh, try and remember. Um, okay, so we we'll start from the end. How we support the game? So one thing that we have done uh, when we started the company, we were tech people. So we said uh, we just we don't want just to do games. Let's do a platform. So, but we took uh, Cocos to DX in the beginning. Uh, and we added on, on top of it, in the beginning I said Flash was banned, so we said let's make something that would be quite easy to create content with, but while we're doing that will give us a single point of change. So we created on top of Cocos 2 dx a kind of an XML language that is supported also with Lua and, uh, and, uh, and uh, it, it evolved during time, but everything is on the same platform, so it means that uh, and the platform has a kind of, uh, now we got to version 6.1, so it, has, it had a lot of evolution. Almost two weeks there is a new cycle, a new release of the platform that has some new features for the games that just need to be launched in the next uh, cycle. But it means that uh, the portfolio management team, when they need to update, they take the new version. They have some regression to do and sometimes things change, but we always keep backward compatibility, so the XML language keeps backward compatibility. Uh, Lua is backward compatible, so, uh, so uh, it's manageable. It's, it's, uh, the whole comp uh, portfolio management team is around eight people, and they, they manage doing a 300 game cycle every four months, so, uh, so it's not a huge team, it's not 50 okay. people. Okay, thank you. And one short question. Can you share the percentage of your titles being successful versus those that So uh, in, in the kids area, there isn't, I mean, the, the amplitude is quite small, you don't get a hit. So the games, uh, just to say a number, so any, uh, all of the games that we produced, uh, they are TROI, and I, I think that it's important that you know what TROI, time to ROI. So you invest in a game, I don't know, 30, 50, 100, 200, thousand dollars, whatever the number is. You want to measure the time it takes you to ROI. Not, also, not only if it makes ROI in three years, but how much time it will take. Most of the titles we produce make ROI, TROI, so time to ROI is around a week to three weeks. Books are slow, they were three months. Education, few weeks, and games can make it even in one to two weeks. Around the titles that are successful, around I think 10% goes above the noise. They make, they get to the top three places in a lot of countries. Uh, um, but at the end, from a monetization point of view, all of the games sell maximum 4.99. So no whales, no tens of millions of dollars. At the end, it's limited. The titles will make anything between, I know, $50,000 in revenue to a million dollar in revenue, but not more than that. But still, it's a nice business, even in the kids' category. And obviously, we're leveraging that into the 13-plus kind of category. So I uh, uh, hope it answered your question. <laughs>